Okay, so today we're going to cover both lesson two and lesson three. So I'm gonna try to move quicker than I did in lesson one, only because I don't want the video to be too long. So starting at the top of the page, it says the set of real numbers is made up of two distinctly different numbers those that are rational and those that are irrational. So the real numbers, I'm gonna put it right on this line for the name. You can think of a tree diagram. So what it's saying is that subsets of the real numbers are irrational numbers and rational numbers. Okay, and you've heard of these terms before, so hopefully this is a review. So first, it says a rational number is any number that can be written as a ratio of two integers. Such numbers include three-fourths, negative seven-thirds, and five over one. These numbers have terminating or repeating decimals. So terminating means the decimals end. Okay, uh, 5 over 1, for example, is really just 5 or 5.0. It ends. So when we talk about, um, I'm going to pick a different fraction, say 1 third. You guys are familiar with 1 third, which is 0 0.33 repeating. So terminating means it ends, okay, and here we have a repeating decimal. An irrational number is any number that is not rational, so therefore its decimals do not repeat and do not end. Okay, so let's look at exercise number one. It says, let's consider a number that is rational and one that is irrational. Consider the number two-thirds and the square root of one over two. Using your calculator, give the decimal representation of two-thirds. Well, some of you may know that already, but let's put in the fraction bar. Always use that fraction bar. So two-thirds. Um, it didn't give me the decimal, so I have to go to math, down to number two, and I want to tell the calculator I want the decimal form. So. And keep in mind, too, that the calculator rounds always that last digit. So this is really 0 0.66 repeating. Okay. Then I move the calculator here. Now we want to write out the decimal places for the square root of 1 half. So we want to type in the square root first, and then our fraction bar 1 half. And we're going to write those numbers out. So the calculator does stop it here, and it may have potentially rounded that last digit. So we're going to write 0 0.707106712. So going back to a repeating decimal. A repeating decimal is rational. One way to remember that, repeating, rational. So this non-repeating doesn't end, right? This is irrational. So let's go down and take a look at example two. I'm also going to start reading right here. Irrational numbers are necessary for a variety of reasons, but they are somewhat of a mystery. In essence, they are a number that can never be found by subdividing an integer quantity into a whole number of parts and then taking an inter integer number of those parts. There are many types of irrational numbers, but square roots of non-perfect squares are always irrational. So our non-perfect squares are those unfriendly radicals or square roots we were talking about last class. So remember our perfect squares are like 1, 4, 9, 16, 25 because 5 times 5 is 25. Okay? 4 squared is 16. 3 squared is 9. So remember the square root operation undoes the square. So the square root of 2 we cannot, right? We cannot take the square root of that. The square root of 10, 
we cannot take the square root of 10. And the square root of 23, we cannot take the square root of 23. So these are all irrational. So it wants us to type them in the calculator and write the decimals. So I'm going to type them all in first and then copy the decimals down. So we have the square root of 2, the square root of 10, and the square root of 23. Okay? So let's take a minute to write those decimals down. And I'll read the numbers aloud as I read them. So the square root of 2 is 1.414213. Five six two. Radical ten is three point one six two two seven seven six six. And the square root of twenty three is four point seven nine five eight three one five two three. And I just want to highlight again, they were going to write it down below nice and large. These are irrational since the decimals do not repeat or end. Okay, we don't have to write non-repeating and non-terminating. They do not repeat or end. Okay, so let's finish up this note page on the back. Okay, um, for time's sake, I wanted to skip A, but let's actually skip the whole thing. Okay, and go down to this next section. We're going to look at an exercise four. Okay, I skipped that little paragraph because I didn't do the examples. So we're going to start with exercise four. It says for each of the following addition or subtraction problems, a rational number has been added to an irrational number. Write out the decimal representation that your calculator gives you and then classify the result, which is your answer. So state if the answer is rational or irrational, and we're going to explain why. So I'm first going to take, before we go and add or subtract, I'm going to put a little R or an I above the rational or irrational number in the sum or difference. So 1 over 2, that is a ratio. We see the division symbol, a 1 to 2 ratio or 1 half. So this is rational. So I'm taking a rational and adding... Okay, the square root of 2. And the square root of 2, it's a non-perfect square, an unfriendly radical, so that's irrational. 4 thirds, that's a ratio. We have the fraction, so that is rational. Plus the square root of 10, 10 is unfriendly, irrational. 7 is a whole number, it's rational. We can write it as a fraction, that would be 7 over 1. And we're going to subtract square root of 8, which is a not a perfect square, it's unfriendly. It is therefore irrational. So now let's add on the calculator. Ready? So now 1 half plus the square root of 2 is that decimal right there. So let's write that down. 1.914213562. Let's look at the next one. 4 thirds plus square root of 10. Okay, so let me read that one to you. That's 4.4956. One zero nine nine four. And last one. So seven minus the square root of eight. So four point 
1715728.75. Oh boy. So these all, so all of these, all decimals do not end or repeat. Okay? Um, so the sum, now keep in mind, let's also add, it could be the sum or difference because really subtraction is the same as adding a negative. So the sum or difference of a, an irrational number and a rational number, so down here, when a rational number is added or subtracted to an irrational number, the result is always irrational. So whenever you're adding or subtracting and one of the numbers is rational and the other number is irrational, you're always going to end up with an irrational number. So in number six, to finish the notes for today, which of the following is an irrational number? All right. So let's take a look at all the answer choices and first put them in simplest form if possible. So the square root of 25 is five. I cut seven and a half, I get three and a half. Four minus, well the square root of nine is three, so four minus three is one. All right. So all of those answer choices, those decimals, and even though there's no decimals there, I can always add the point zero, all of those decimals end. So therefore, that's rational. Um, the only one, therefore, that would be irrational is 3 plus radical 6. And remember that a rational number plus an irrational number equals an irrational number. And that could be an explanation, if I can make the number symbol, that could be the, your explanation on the New York State Regents. Whenever you add or subtract a rational number and an irrational number, you get an irrational number. Okay, now for some fun stuff, uh, the graphing, at least I think it's more fun. And that's why your homework page, right, or your practice page is out of um, your packet that I sent home. It's an actual worksheet because we need to graph on paper. I know our calculators do it, but um, some of you may or may not have a calculator, so we can't, may not be able to graph using that tool, but you can always graph in just using pen and paper. So that's what we're going to do, okay, because I know everyone has pen and paper. So let's look at the top, okay. Square roots are operations on numbers that give exactly one output for a given input. So they fit nicely into the definition of a function. We can graph the general square root function over which we establish a very important fact. So whenever you go to take the square root of a negative number, so the square root of negative 4, okay, you see we're going to get an answer. We can't take the square roots of negatives. Okay, well, we can, um, but you're just going to get an imaginary number, and you'll talk more about that in Algebra 2, so I'm just going to stop there. Okay, but this just says y is 2 or negative 2, not the answer. And that's because when we take 2 and we square it, so that means 2 times 2, we get a positive 4 not the negative 4, okay? And then when I take a negative 2 and square it, as that's the inverse operation of the square root, as we talked about in the last note, um, negative 2 times negative 2 is also a positive 4. There's nothing you can square that will give you a negative answer. You always end up with a positive answer, okay? So let's skip that part. Now down to the graph. Okay, so let's move this whole section there. Good. So 
The little paragraph above, so I'm just going to read it on my page, says, It is absolutely critical that you understand deep down inside why finding the square root of a negative number is not possible, okay, with any real number. And we always graph on a real axis, meaning we're using fractions, decimals, whole numbers, right? So we're going to look at the function. So it's been a long time since we've seen functions. So this will be a great review for your final. All right, so the function is the square root of x. Now we have no calculator, so how the heck are we going to do this? Well, it wants us to pick x's, right? Our x's go in the table right here. And remember, you can always write your table like this if you prefer. It's just he and his worksheet, you know, put it like that. And remember, it's your y that's the f of x because this is your input. Input the domain, output the range. So we have a graph already provided. So we can pick any number on this x-axis, right, to put into our function. But we also want to keep in mind, too, if we're going to be taking the square root, it's easiest to take the square roots of perfect squares. So let's start and put in 0. Okay, so the square root of 0. Well, the square root of 0 is 0. Let's do square root of 1. Square root of 1 is 1. The square root of 2. Now, 2 is unfriendly and we can't take the square root, so let's skip it. Um, square root of 3. Mm, that's also unfriendly. Square root of 4. We can take the square root of that. Square root of 4 is 2. So let's plot these three points so far. So 0, 0, 1, 1. The x goes first. 4, 2. So 0, 0 is right here. 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, right there. Okay, so this is what our curve looks like so far. All right. 5. 5 is unfriendly. Can't take the square root of 5. Cannot take the square root of 6, 7, no, 8, no, 9, yes. The square root of 9 is 3. So let's count out 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 2, 3. Now, we could essentially keep going. I mean, there's an error, the arrow there. So we're going to put the arrow here. But the arrow doesn't go at this end, and they could have extended the graph, right? Um, I have a pencil here. But the reason why they didn't extend it is because right here would be a negative 1. We can't take the square roots of negative numbers, so it has to start with 0. Okay? So, all right, domain. Domain and range. So domain is x, range is y. So what are all of the x values of this function? And from what I remember, we were better at the interval notation. So on the x-axis, we're going from, if we look in our table in orange, we're going from 0, and again, it's got the arrow, it keeps going. So from 0 to infinity, because there's the arrow. Now, we are actually stopping at 0. So we have to have the bracket. But remember, infinity always has the parenthesis. The other notation is just all x values greater than or equal to 0, because we have 0 in our table. Okay. Now the y values. So we can look here at our table as well. The lowest y value here okay, is right here. So in pink, it goes here. And it goes, if I keep looking, we keep getting farther and farther away from the x-axis. So our y value keeps increasing of all of these points. Okay, If the arrow is there, it doesn't ever stop. So that pattern is going to continue and it's going to keep getting farther and farther off the um, x-axis. So our y values are going to continue to decrease. And while I'm thinking of it, let's put that last point in the table. So our y values also start at 0 and go to infinity. So the domain and range just happen to be the same for that function. So in terms of the other notation, the inequality notation, it's y greater than or equal to 0. Party. 
circle the correct choice below for the characteristics of this function. Is it always decreasing or is it always increasing? Remember, f of x, okay, grab another highlighter, f of x is the y value. So our, our y values, we look at the table, what's going on with the y values? They are always going up. The y values are always getting higher, okay? What shape does this represent? The half of? Well, it's kind of half ways and sideways. So it, here's the parabola, right? And then we turn it sideways, and it's just that part of it, okay? So let's say half of a parabola on its side. Okay, I hope we're doing good on time. And the last thing we're going to do is the back of this page, which I think is still fun. Because a lot of these questions on the state test are multiple choice. So that's a good thing, even though we're not taking the state test. Uh, if you do take an assessment someday, we typically see these as multiple choice. All right, um, exercise three. Here's the graph of the function. So instead of using f of x, they use y equals. So I'm just going to highlight that in yellow or orange. And there we go. There's the function. Now this one says, using your calculator, graph the function given by this one. So this one I will highlight in pink. So we're going to graph another square root function. And because, right, we don't have a calculator, we're going to do it by hand. And by hand is okay. So I'm going to make a table. And I don't have much room, so I am going to go this way. And let's um, pick, oh boy, let's pick three points to, four points to graph it. So let's do negative four to start. Um, and I'm doing that because this grid goes out one, two, three, four to the left, okay? So we're gonna take and we're gonna do the math in our head. And so we plug in negative four for x, what do we get for y? So negative four plus four is zero. The square root of zero is zero, and zero plus two is 2. Okay, so our first point is negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2. So it starts there. Okay, um, now let's plug in negative 3. So negative 3 plus 4 is 1. The square root of 1 is 1, and then 1 plus 2 is 3. So let's graph negative 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. So now I'm going to plug in a negative 2. Now negative 2 plus 4 is 2, but I can't take the square root of 2. Hmm. So I don't want to use negative 2 because that's going to give me an unfriendly radical. Well, let's see what negative 1 does. Negative 1 plus 4 is 3. And I can't take the square root of 3. Well, how about if I plug in 0? 0 plus 4 is 4, and 4 is a perfect square that works. So 0 plus 4 is 4, the square root of 4 is 2, and then 2 plus 2 is 2. Good. Let's just do one more. So 0, let's say 2 plus 2 is 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. I'm going to say that can't be lower. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It has to have that shape. I noticed it was going to be way down here. I'm like, there's no bend in the curve. It has to have the same shape as that one. So the last point, if I plug in 1, 1 plus 4 is 5. We cannot take the square root of 5. I plug in 2, 2 plus 4 is 6. We can't take the square root of 6. I plug in the 3, 3 plus 4 is 7. We can't take the square root of 7. I plug in 4, 4 plus 4 is 8, we can't take the square root of 8, so let's plug in 5. 5 plus 4 is 9, and the square root of 9 is 3, so good, let's use 5. And then 3 plus 2 is 5. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And let's stop there, because it is kind of a pain, and let's put the arrow. Should have the same shape. 
So what's the new domain and range? Well, there was a shift, right? There was a shift left one, two, three, four, up two. Okay, so let's write that down. Let's put it right. Um, so let's note it here, I guess. We don't have much room. Shift right. I'm sorry. Uh, we can't because we're answering that question. Um, let's call this graph one and graph two. So when you're going from one to two, there is a shift left four and up two. Good. State the domain of this function. So that's function number two. All right. So how far left do we go? Our starting point is right here, and that's at negative 4. And then on the x-axis, we go all the way to infinity. So let's do negative 4 to infinity. And then the range, so on the y-axis, we're starting at 2, and we're going higher. So that is 2 higher. Okay? And let's just write an interval notation because you like it that way. Now we're going to graph the function, and we're not going to use our calculator, okay? We're going to use a little trick, okay? So up here in this function, we saw that it moved um, left 4 up 2. The number underneath, so right here, this minus 1, that tells us our shift left and right, okay? The other number, so this number 4, that tells us the sh shift up and down. So this graph, so let's call this number 3, to graph it, we take, so to go from 1, let me see if you can see that, 1 to 3, we take the original function and move it, now it's opposite. You would think that plus 4 meant it was going to go right 4, but it actually went left 4. So what underneath is opposite. So this is going to go right 1. So it's right shift. I'm not doing a table because we're not doing it on the calculator. Shift right 1 and then down 4. Okay? So we take a point. So we take points where we see hit um, the corner of our grid. So right here. 0, 0. So we have to take it right 1, down 4. So right 1, down 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's find another point. Looks like 1, 1. So we're going to go right 1, down 1, 2, 3, 4. And then another one right here. So I'm just taking where it hits the corner. Right 1, down 1, 2, 3, Four. And then I'm going to take another point right here, right one, down one, two, three, four. So we just took what we learned in graphing the first one by hand, the little trick. And that has to do with how it's written. Whatever is written outside of the symbol means up or down. And it makes sense here. Plus two is going to go up, down four is going to go down underneath the symbol or within the symbol of the function, this is a square root function, so within that square root symbol, if it's a plus, it actually goes left, it's opposite. And you can always see what happens on your calculator. So for instance, if I type, let's do the first one, go to the y equals square root of x, and then the square root of x minus 1 underneath, move outside minus 4 graph. So here's the first one, so that was there, and you can see that it went right and down. So knowing it's going to go right and down, you can help remember right and down. Okay? And then so let's use that down here and let's not even use the calculator. Okay? Let's not even do it by hand. Let's take what we knew or what we learned from above with that shift left, right, up, down. So based here, 
Okay, because of this, I'll use orange, because of the x plus 3, okay, the plus means, what does it mean? We're going to go left, it's opposite. So we go left, 3, and then the minus 2 means we're going to go down 2. You move all the points that same distance. So let's take this point right here. Let's go left three, down two. So left, one, two, three, down two. And it's gonna say the same shape, right? So this is up one, over one, up one, over one. It's gonna be up one, over one, up one, over one, up one, over one. And then this left side is up one, left one, up one, left one. It's gonna stay the same shape. And I do have a ruler. So let's trace that. And let's label this, again, original function 1, this one a 2. So let's put a 1 right here and then a 2 right there for our notes. The domain and range of this function. Now for the domain, which is the x's, there's arrows. Say this is, I mean, this is your vertex. It's, you can think of it as a starting point. You're going to continue to move left. There's an arrow. You don't stop. And then from there, you continue to move right. You don't stop. It's covering everything on the x-axis. So we go from negative infinity to positive infinity. And then the range, well, the v's not going, you know, sideways, right? It's not pointing this way. So it's not going to cover the whole thing. It's starting right here. So its lowest number is right here at negative 2, but then it continues to go up. So that's from negative 2 to infinity. Okay. And lastly, we're going to sketch this. So we take the original function, and based on the part inside the function, which is the absolute value, value based on the first one, that minus 2, again, inside is opposite. You think left because it's negative, but you actually move right 2. And then the minus 1 is still the same. Let's actually change that to, I don't know, let's do plus 4. Let's make it more exciting. So that means we're going to go up 4. It may not fit, but it's something different. And I'll graph this one in red. So from the original function, because this is the most basic or parent function, we're going to take this one and go right 2, up 4. So from 0, 0, right 1, 2, up 1, 2, 3, 4. And remember, it keeps the same shape which is up one, right one, up one, right one. So up one, right one, up one, right one. Same here, up one, left one, up one, left one. So up one, left one, up one, left one. And I don't need a ruler because it's small. And that's all that'll fit. And let's call that number three. All right, I hope to see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Bye-bye.